ladies and gentlemen, head coach of the USC Trojans, Lincoln Riley. What's up, fellas? Hey, I see you don't have the Travis Kelsey fade, I guess, but you do have good haircut, coach. Good haircut over there. We got some good barbers in L.A. They take good care of us. Yeah, as they should. Uh, let's talk about your time in L.A. It's been filled with a man named Caleb Williams, who is described by everybody as one of the most electrifying college football players of all time. Now he's making the jump to college ball. I just learned from Schefter he does not have an agent. Uh, how much are you involved in this entire transition process for Caleb? And what has your messaging kind of been as he makes his jump to the NFL? Yeah, we're trying to give him some support. You know, we've been lucky enough, like you said, to have a couple of guys go go through this. Um, you know, this is this is different though. Um, certainly in that, you know, the process has obviously evolved through the years, the attention around it. Um, you know, for Caleb, I think it's all it's all happened really fast. I mean, you get out here, you win the Heisman. Um, you know, in the last four years, he's only played two and a half years of football. He's still very young, kind of in his in his climb, but he's excited about it and he's got a great mindset. And I think he's you know, the thing I've always appreciated about him is like he, he's always thinking about the next step and it's always the big picture. You know, at Oklahoma, there was a time in the beginning where we weren't going to take him. And he said, well, fine, coach, I'll just walk on like that's that's his mindset. Like it's always about that next step. And so he's he's ready for this. He's excited for it. And we're hoping he ends up in a great situation. Go ahead, AJ. Coach, how do you think his game uh, transitions to the NFL? We are. He seems to be what you're looking for when you talk about quarterbacks, especially now at the NFL where a lot more run-pass situations where you can use your athletic ability. How do you think that translates to the next level? I think it translates well uh, because he is. He's got he's athletically, you know, typically one of the best athletes on the field, but then his ability to uh, to create, his ability to to throw from all different angles, all different platforms is really, really special. Uh, he's continuing to become a better situational quarterback, and the more reps he gets, the better that he's going to be. But he's going to have some advantages physically when he steps on the field with anyone, and it's a that's a great start, and then it'll just be a climb from there. You've been able to coach a lot of successful quarterbacks who have made the jump, both athletic quarterbacks, pocket passers, and everything. He'll be able to continue to play the way he plays at the NFL, you think? Uh, I think his game will have to adapt um, because people, and we saw this some even this year, like people are going to try to defend him differently. You know, and you guys know, like, you know, everybody's going to try to get the book on what works against you and they're going to continue to try different things. And so as a quarterback, you've got to learn to find different ways to win, different ways to move the football and be, and be productive. And so he'll have to adapt because there'll be some people that'll want to keep him in the pocket uh, that'll want to, you know, make him win the game from that, from that uh, perspective. He physically certainly can do it. And, and that'll just be part of his climb. And again, I think that's why it's so important. A guy like this has got to get in the right situation where he's developed. He's got the right people around him so that he can continue to climb as a player. Okay, let's talk about the situation around him with the right people. Cliff Kingsbury just got hired by the Commanders to be the offense coordinator. Obviously, he was with you guys last year. Caleb said, my dog, congrats. They're a potential suitor for Caleb Williams. Have How many of these teams have reached out to you to talk about Caleb? I assume all of them. And what is the messaging or the questions that they're asking? Yeah, we've talked to quite a few already. Uh, I, I think... You know, people see the talent on the field. I think they're wanting to know about the guy, you know, in the meeting room. They're wanting to know about the guy in the locker room, the type of leader he is, uh, the type of person that he is. And I think just trying to get a great feel. You know, if you're going to take somebody as, you know, as, as one of the first picks in the NFL draft, you know, typically your questions on the field are, are pretty much answered. It's it's they're trying to learn, like, really what makes the, this person tick? What, what can we really expect here if this guy's going to become – potentially the face of our franchise. And so, uh, yeah, that process has been cool. Um, we're, we're excited how it plays out. It would be awesome to see him reunite with Cliff, certainly in, in Washington, but we know there's a lot of things out of control and a lot of things that will uh, transpire between now and then. Yeah, there's a lot of things that have been transpiring. In draft season, as you know, as mm -hmm. a guy who's had a lot of successful – uh, quarterbacks and players before so much bullshit gets out yeah. there speaking of the bullshit Connor has a question for you yeah coach basically I want to say since like December this has been going on with Caleb Williams where there'll be reports about something that his camp says or something that his father has said about maybe not wanting to go to a Chicago or forcing his way you know elsewhere and things of that nature 
Is that something that you have dealt with, or is this just complete and utter bullshit of teams that maybe are a little, you know, higher in the draft and want to kind of bash his name, <laughs> which we know is going to happen throughout these next two months leading up to the draft? I mean, we just saw it with C.J. Stroud, and then we saw how that turned out for him in Houston. But is is that just complete BS? And is the narrative around Caleb kind of been skewed to the point where people aren't really sure exactly who he is? And do you think that's on purpose as well? Yeah, I think it's a total smoke screen. I mean, I think it's people playing the game. Um, I, like knowing Caleb, like location wise, I don't think he cares one bit about where he's at. Like all of these, all of these franchises are in really good cities. Like really, there's advantages to anywhere that you could go. He wants to win. Uh, he wants to be a guy that's playing in this game that's getting ready to come up this week. And 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 I think for him, it's less about location and it's just more about getting in the right situation where he knows he can continue to develop and do the things that he needs to do to help a franchise be successful. And that's it. And he's got a one track mind that way. So, uh, no, I, I don't think there's any truth to that at all. The guy wants to win. He's a competitor. Certainly. I know he would love to go first overall. I mean, as any competitor who wouldn't, uh, but at the end of the day, it's about winning for him and nothing else. It has Caleb's camp. That's how it's being described as just showed up at your office every single day throughout the season and told you you're doing things wrong. Is that, is that how it's going? <laughs> yeah, they've got a, they've got a uh, little corner office over here. right? <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. That's how it's being portrayed, though, Coach. That's literally how it's kind of being portrayed. It's like Caleb's camp says this. Caleb's camp says this. And I'm always like, I'm sick of hearing about what Caleb's camp. I want to hear Caleb. Caleb doesn't talk much. Is that is that an accurate depiction of the situation there? Yeah, he's he's just very low key about it all, and so yeah, it's 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 honestly the group of people he's got around him are really good. They were really really low maintenance in all the years that we worked with them, whether it was recruiting them uh, in the beginning or working with them the last three years. Uh, really r low maintenance group, and Caleb wants it that way because again, he's he's about one thing. He's about ball. Um, and he's about winning, and, and they try oh, to keep yeah. the main thing the main thing. So, listen, he's just in a position like he's a lightning rod right now. If he doesn't talk, it's a big story. If he talks, it's a big story. Like there's there's going to be attention no matter what. And but at the end of the day, uh, this kid's about the right things. Uh, he's going to make a, an NFL team very happy. Man, I hope a lot of people are listening to you. And we got to remember this through the entire draft process as the smokescreen bullshit mm -hmm. comes in abundance, I would assume. And to Connor's point earlier, normally it's teams that are like sitting at three or four yeah. that are the ones putting this out there so that they hope that he falls. It's like it's a fascinating world whenever you're one of the top prospects, which obviously Caleb yeah. is. Speaking of top prospects, d -Bot has a question yeah, for you. Low-maintenance low Caleb Williams might be breaking. Yeah, uh, that is. Put on the ticker. <laughs> for Put sure. on the ticker. As well. And I know, uh, Coach, you probably don't love talking about yourself, uh, but obviously you coach Baker, uh, Kyler, and these guys went number one, one Heisman Trophy. Even Jalen Hurts, when he came over to your offense, you saw him develop a bunch in your offense as a passer. What is it about your offense or your coaching style that really brings the best out of these uh, quarterbacks? Well, listen, I mean, first, guys like that aren't real tough to coach. I mean, that's we, we've been lucky to have several phenomenal guys. So it, it starts and ends there. Um, we've, you know, we've got a great staff. We've got guys that have been together for a long time. Uh, you know, we, we love coaching. We love developing it. And I think, you know, as we've had some guys that were successful, it's helped attract, you know, more great prospects to come want to be a part of this and, and to grow themselves. And so, it's been it's been a great ride with those guys, man. It's been surreal to, to see those guys go have success. I, I was able to go to the the Bucks and Eagles uh, playoff game uh, there a few weeks ago, and to see you know two of your guys out there duking it out in the NFL playoffs is, was uh, was a really cool moment. So, yeah, just I think like anything, man, we've we've got a lot of good people that surround them, and we've got a good system that that allows these guys to succeed, and they've got a lot of confidence when they come in the door that that they are going to improve, and that's what's happened, Coach. Are we fixing the defense or what? <laughs> you know, Coach, I mean, that's been the M.O. Hasn't I mean, I just got baptized into the college football world. Boom. Last two years. And obviously, you've seen the experiment. Not everybody loves me out there. <laughs> a lot of people hate me. But, like, the only story about your teams are, like, well, on the defensive side, though. On the defensive side, though. Mm -hmm. On the defensive side, though. Do you think that's fair that they say that about your teams? And how do we think we go about fixing that? Yeah, I do think it's fair. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you know, the, the the two schools that I've been a head coach at, I mean, you're you're defined by championships. And I've, I love coaching in places like that. And the reality is there's there's not going to be much in between when you're at those schools. The championships are the expectations and you've got to play, 
you got to play great on all sides, but certainly you got to play elite level defense to get it done. And so uh, we haven't done that in the first two years here. I, I don't hide from that, uh, but also don't hide from the fact of the, the defensive staff that we just brought in here, I think is second to none uh, anywhere. And we, we started with a bunch of names on the board that we thought were some of the best coaches and best developers in football. And for some of these guys to leave some of the situations that they did to come coach for us here at USC, I think speaks a lot uh, to, to the trajectory that they see this program on and what it can become. So I, I think this staff is, is phenomenal. Um, and yeah, I can't wait to get started with this group. Hell yeah, coach. Cause I, I'm a believer. I love, mm -hmm. I, like, I like, uh, I like when USC and I guess I'm just going back to the Pete Carroll era, but I like when USC is the, yeah. you know, glitz, gl it's LA. Like this is, when USC is good, everything's great. And obviously you guys have brought a lot to the college football world over the last couple of years, especially Caleb Williams in the offense. But it's like, let's go, mm -hmm. now, let's go. Especially with the future of what college football is. Go ahead, AJ. Coach, you mentioned earlier, like, yeah, a guy like Caleb Williams, any quarterback really needs to be in the right system at the next level. How important is that relationship with the offensive play caller and the quarterback? I know I say a lot. I think the offensive play caller has so much influence on that game and obviously on that quarterback's career. Like how, how big of a relationship do you think or like how important is that to those guys to get along and have like a truly collaborative situation? Well, I think it's critical, you know, because I, I think the, the most important thing playing quarterback, in my opinion, is, is confidence. It's a confidence-driven position, and there's no way – that you can play that position with that much confidence if you don't have that relationship and that trust with the person that's designing it or calling it uh, because the, the success is so often tied together and and you have to be in sync and and that is that's critical and so uh having that time together having that time where you build up the trust uh, where you know uh, what each other's thinking, you can really stay in sync. I mean, I, I think that's everything, and that, that'll be critical for Caleb at the next level. And, you know, most of the guys that have been great quarterbacks in any era, you could see them tied to somebody. I mean, like, look what Patrick has done with with Coach Reed, right? Like, I mean, I promise you, he trusts that guy more than you can imagine, and that makes a big difference, and that's a lot of why he plays the position the way he does. Well, and also, Andy trusts him, mm -hmm. you know? So it's yeah. uh, it goes both ways whenever you're that close. Speaking of things that are kind of, like, uh, close, right now, college football seemingly close to the edge of disaster, allegedly. If you listen to some of the narratives that are cooking, Ty has a question for you. Yeah, Coach, we've seen a lot of people say that, hey, if they don't get guardrails on the NIL situation right now, we're going to see more things like uh, in like this recent hiring cycle. You know, Boston College's he head coach, Jeff Halfley, takes a job with the Packers as a defensive coordinator, and he basically says, hey, anymore, it's just recruiting your own guys and fundraising. I really don't get to coach ball anymore. Um, it, in your time at USC, obviously – you know, Pat mentioned it, you know, the, the glitz and the glamour of being in L.A. You guys have used the transfer portal. You've brought in people. Is it one of those things where with NIL you kind of just have to embrace it and work it to your benefit? Otherwise, you will be like one of those guys who kind of gets left out in, in the lurch. And so how have you kind of addressed that and looked into that? I'm sure it's much more difficult at USC than it is a lot of places. And how have you kind of seen that evolve just over the last several years of being a head coach at a major program? Yeah, the, the problem is right now is we're we're stuck in between a in a, in between an amateur and a professional model. Uh, and anytime you're stuck in between two different things, it's going to cause it's going to cause problems. It's going to cause issues, and that's what's happened. Now the game's still phenomenal, right? The product on Saturdays is as good as it's ever been. And uh, and and I do believe that I do believe in college football. I do believe that it's going to get fixed. We do have some problems right now that that make it very difficult for, for coaches, players, administrators, everyone. And, and we've caused a lot of these problems, but I do believe there's a solution there and the game is way too good to let something like this mess it up. And so, yeah, it's my hope that we'll get it fixed. Uh, it needs to get fixed because there's no successful business. You, you, whether you're talking about the NFL or any other business out there that has nothing to do with sports, like you can't run this way and sustain it. And we got to fix it. Yeah. How, how? Uh, you know, because there's different states like California's laws, vastly different than Ohio's laws, 
which are vastly different than Texas's laws. We're talking sports here. We're not talking about <laughs> everything else that's happening in the world as well. But it's like you got different state laws that are taking place. And then the NCAA, seemingly, and we won't put you in a bad spot. I'll say it so you don't, are picking and choosing on when to potentially attack. It's like, how do you fix it? We need a college football czar? That's what everybody's saying. Like, need a commissioner? How, how In your eyes, I'm not, I'm not saying you need to give us the answer now. It is fixable. And, and how do you think you've envisioned that? before or now it, it is and i mean i i feel like at some point it's going to start to mirror and we'll see how closely it gets but it's going to start to mirror some of these professional leagues i think at some point right those leagues do it with different states and they've navigated it well and and they do they've they uh they have one commissioner and and that person makes the decisions for everybody else and at the end of the day that's everybody plays under the same set of rules with the same circumstances and that's that, i think that's all ever, anybody's looking for so it's, it's going to take some time. It's not going to happen overnight. But, again, we have way too good of a product to, to let it get tarnished by this. Especially with how it's all growing, seemingly. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't lose the tradition, can't lose the pageantry, can't yep. lose the game. But, boy, we need to make sure we sustain it and grow it without bullshit getting involved. Speaking of, there is a new day coming upon yep. us. Go ahead, Tone. Yeah, Coach, we're going to the 12-team uh, playoff now for the, the first year. And I was wondering – have you talked about or thought about or have coaches talked about coaching differently now that it's a 12 team playoff versus a 14 playoff like per like with you guys going to the Big 10 there's probably going to be three or four teams that get in from the Big 10 there's going to be two lost teams there's going to be three lost teams that get on get in and there's going to be more games at the end of the year have you taught have you thought about are you guys going to have to adjust coaching like whether you're when you're up 21 you don't have to be up 30 to look good for the voters or anything like that getting guys out sooner maybe less practice days during the week or less hitting during the week because you're going to have those extra two or three games at the end of the year. Have you guys talked or thought about that at all? Yeah, we, we have. Uh, I think it's interesting from a scheduling standpoint just because, like you said, with this previous model, you know, you could afford to lose – you know, one game yeah. at the most. And then after that, you lose any more than that. You got, you know, you virtually have very, very little shot of, of getting in the playoff where now that's changed. You know, I think the other thing that'll be interesting that people I haven't really heard anybody talk about is, you know, if you get to the end of the year and you're undefeated, at some point, do you maybe look at resting your guys, knowing that you're already guaranteed mm -hmm. a playoff spot? And I know there's a buy and all that, but like that's something in college football that nobody's ever, like you've never even heard of that. But that actually, that actually like could happen now, which is, which is interesting because you could potentially play three more games. And so um, it's a good thing, though, man. Listen, you, you should not – like what happened to Florida State this year, that should never happen anywhere ever. And uh, so that I'm really, really glad that that piece is going to be fixed. Agreed with the Florida State thing. The whole um – Boy, you rest these 18 to 23 year olds for a game. Man, get, get, I can already hear it. You know, maybe more so at Oklahoma than it is at USC. Uh, maybe a little different viewpoints in LA versus in Oklahoma. But you're telling me 20 year olds need to. Jeez. Oh, jeez. Not my football. How soft is this world? I mean, I can already see the people getting pissed off about it. But if you win games, you're able to do – you earn yeah. the right to make that decision. I'm excited to see the new trail sure. be blazed by everybody. Speaking of new trail being blazed, go ahead, AJ. Coach, so you guys are, are coming to the, the Big Ten. I wonder what kind of challenges does that present? Does it change anything that you do throughout the week? Logistically, obviously, travel may be a little different. And what are your, what's your outlook going into the Big Ten? Are you guys excited, I would imagine? Hard-nosed football, Lincoln. Yeah. Hard-nosed yeah. football. The cold. <laughs> you know, I, I, I hear everybody saying, like, well, it's so weird that, like, USC's in the Big Ten. But, like, flip that, too, like, Think of the Rose Bowl every year and how awesome the Rose Bowl has been. Pac-12, all the iconic Pac-12 Big Ten matchups where you're going to have these now like week in and week out. And some of the like new rivalries going and playing in these different venues for all the teams, like I think it's going to be awesome. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about going into the league. It's a tremendous league that's only been made better by these additions. Um, yeah, there's. I think we've made a few adjustments and now we've constructed the roster, but a lot of that has just been – Look, we took over for a struggling program that we're trying to climb back into to national prominence, and 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 a lot of that just involves you know, growing the roster, you know, to get it to that level anyway. So I think some of this we would have been doing regardless, but yeah, I, I, we're excited about it, man. I mean, the schedule we're getting ready to play, the different rivalries that are getting ready to come up from this, I think are going to be really special. How about the 9 a.m. local <laughs> kickoffs? Like that's bullshit. 
that that's going to happen to you guys. I think, personally, just as a guy who's not a morning person. I am not a morning person at all. That is not how I operate. My wife wakes up, new day, here we go. I'm so pumped for her. For me, I need to live a little bit of life before I come to light. I'm powered by the moon more so than the sun. You got, do you, like, is that something you have to address with the team? Like, do you have to find guys and, like, let them know, wait, hey, we're going to be eating breakfast before a game, 6 a.m. local time sometimes before a game that could depend whether or not we make it into the college football playoff or not. That's absurd to think about, but I guess it's just the new world. How, how do you address that type of shit? Yeah, it is. And, and, and for us, so I think it helps because it, it flips that you're not going to have the late kickoff window, you know, which we had a lot in the Pac-12 and, you know, where you're kicking off at 1030 Eastern time. Oh. Um, and that's the ones that, we, really, you know, we really wanted to avoid those. And the Big Ten's, you know, play or the Big Ten's uh, TV windows were much better. And I don't think we'll have too many of the 9 a.m. kicks when we're out here. We may have a few when we go when we go east. And that's OK, because shoot, then you actually get home at a decent time as well. So, <laughs> yeah, I think at the end of the day, trading that was way better for us it's better from an exposure standpoint and listen our you know it's our job we got to have these dudes ready to roll at any point so we got to be powered by the sun and the moon baby i appreciate that <laughs> somebody's yeah. got to have a good playlist somebody's got to have yeah. a good playlist that's in right. there that's you, right. you open with lsu good luck through it all congrats on obviously another top pick in the draft it seems like that can only help recruiting wise and uh, we appreciate your time today pal Definitely. Appreciate you guys. Hey, we'll see you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, head coach of USC Trojans, Lincoln Riley. Yeah, Lincoln!